like uh, there's this obscure thriller called Miracle Mile where that's a big part of it. It's a really good movie, but you watch it in 2024 and it's kind of like it feels like something from the Paleolithic era. <laughs> All right, by the way, secretly we've been recording the entire time. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Brogan, and I am here with my friend Thomas. What's up, party people? Uh, if you had listened to the Fatal Frame episode of the Daydreamcast, you would know that Thomas Wilde is an accomplished writer, um, and he's also a horror expert. And we are here today to talk about the Silent Hill short game that came out, the short message. Um, but before we do that, Thomas, can we actually dive into your experiences and thoughts with Silent Hill as a franchise? Uh, I've played most of them. I haven't... What? Nobody's played Book of Memories, so I think I feel pretty clear about that. But uh, I've, I played most of them back in the day. Uh, I remember early on, they were kind of like resident evil's less fun cousin because yeah. the the first two or three in particular really fall back into uh having slightly awkward combat as a deliberate simulation of the fact that you're playing it just some dude you yeah know, you aren't a mil you aren't a military specialist or somebody who's even had any kind of training um you know in the first game harry mason is a freelance writer in the second game i think you eventually find out james sunderland is like a clerk I didn't know that. I played Silent Hill 2 like four times. I had no idea what he did for a living. His Well, you, you never, if I remember correctly, you never find out in Silent Hill 2. It's in late in Silent Hill 4. You oh, find yeah. his dad. You're making your way through an apartment building and you find his dad's place. Yeah. As a matter of fact, none of them talking about it. I think it might have been in like some out of game source because a lot of games from the late 90s to early 2000s have tons of Im background information that is forever locked for the english-speaking audience behind like japanese guides and tankabons and just various out of game interviews that you could you could com completely be excused even if you are the most hardcore fan for not knowing they exist yeah um to tie back to the combat thing real quick i I always think of it as sort of a way to encourage the running away element. Having the combat be so awkward means like it, like at least whenever I would do it, whenever I would do the Resident Evil thing of like just shooting and emptying my pistol magazine or whatever until it's like, until the thing is dead, it felt, it, it would always feel a little bit tedious to the point of like, oh, I am supposed to uh, run around these monsters. So in a roundabout way, it achieves a similar effect, but makes it less action-y as a focus. And um, I also feel like um, with Silent Hill 1, especially when you look at like the cut scenes or whatever, and like at the original production, I felt like it was much more ambitious um, as like a sort of like seller title and then once the franchise starts to go on and Team Silent starts to really know what they want to do instead of what the publisher wants to do uh, they have much more freedom to make other titles you know yeah I don't know I always felt like the big triumph of Silent Hill compared to other games in this lane is that uh, even on the higher difficult Ooh. even on the higher difficulties the uh, combat isn't particularly difficult and you're always given a usually it doesn't take very long to get a pretty decent melee weapon and and resources yeah. are like incredibly plentiful like insanely pl yeah. plentiful yeah that was actually my favorite part of uh, Silent Hill Origins in the PlayStation Portable because it was made in a big hurry by a new team that one of the guys who helped make it used to post a lot on something awful so i remember hearing a few of his stories of the behind the scenes on it but as one of the consequences one of the things you could do in that game was it gave you uh small items you could pick up and take with you as a one-shot high damage melee weapon like portable tvs and toasters that's sort of, like the idea was that you would take it in a big double-handed grip and just kind of Sw you know, hold it over your head and then swing it down on something, it would break, but it would do a lot of damage in the process, which is kind of a cool idea for a mechanic and an improvised weapons game. But the thing is, you could 
pick it up and put it in your inventory and take it with you. And if you always forgot to use them as regularly as I did, mm -hmm. it meant that you would end the game with the contents of an entire mid-sized hardware store inside your <laughs> trucker vest. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think I, I think I went back and looked before the final boss, and I had, you know, 12 portable TVs, five radios, a couple of toasters. There you go. Hey, I mean, hey, maybe maybe real truck drivers have that sort of inventory too. Who knows? Um, but it's been uh, a long time to talk to one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not on the uh, the land lots for the lizards. Uh, but anyways, what is your favorite Silent Hill? You know, probably Silent Hill three because it of the original four, it's still the one with the most likable and best written protagonist. I'd agree. Um, it feels like, to a certain extent, Harry, James, and Henry are all written as, depending on how you want to interpret it, either audience surrogates who don't really react to anything because the idea is that the player is doing all the reacting. You're, they're supposed to be kind of a cipher. Or, and, and then some emotional distance to the point of uh, disturbing, depending on the specific protagonist, I would say. I've always kind of wanted to ask the scenario designers on the Silent Hill 4 whether that was the idea with Henry or whether they were deliberately making him underreact to everything because the idea in the backstory is that he's been trapped in his apartment for days and an insomniac on top of that. So he's not creepily withdrawn. He's just sleep deprived of the fact where everything feels like a hallucination to him. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where. They could go either way, and I'd be fine with it. I'm just kind of curious which one it is. I think for me personally, the I, I agree. I think Silent Hill 3 is the best for multiple reasons. Um, I think particularly for me, it sort of does a, a, a great balance. I think if you play one... I love Silent Hill 1, especially for the PS1 aesthetic, but I also like, you know, it's, it's you know, horror story, and it, it's a lot more basic, but also has some cool uh, cult stuff to it. And then Silent Hill 2 goes for a much more deeper focus on, obviously, the psychological aspects, but then, like, the town at large. And I feel like Silent Hill 3 was able to tie in both um, the culture of the cult and, like, a lot of more of the Silent Hill 1 elements, but have a, still a sort of mission statement regarding um, the protagonist's uh, mentality and their personality. And, obviously, with the character... Um, I will say Heather this time around um, instead of spoiling it. Um, she, she, the things built around her, she is a much more strong character on her own removed from you as a player. And um, a lot of stuff reflects her own anxieties and stuff. So I think that all works. And then as a game, I just think it's a better game, you know? Yeah, it's definitely got, uh, and it's got some of the more interesting secrets in the entire series. Mm -hmm. But if I had to point to one thing about it that it does better than the other games, it's simply that Heather feels like a more realized central presence in the game than any of the other Silent Hill protagonists. I would go so far as to say that as a central viewpoint character, she's the strongest one in this series to date. I don't think that's really contestable, to be honest. Um... Well, Anita in Short Message is really her only competition. Well, okay, I'm kind of underselling Murphy from Downpour, but... I think Anita is probably her the next one in line, and you know Anita only has a two-hour game, and she's kind of deliberately annoying for most of it. L little curious because you're you're addressing a lot of the post Team Silent stuff, but you haven't mentioned it. What do you think of Shattered Memories? It makes me deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> That's fair. That's totally fair. One of my big. Uh, things that I don't like in horror games. And this is kind of a sacred cow for a lot of people in the audience. But one of the things that I don't like about that particular game is that it leans very heavily on the outlast mechanic of, or for that matter, amnesia, where anytime anything shows up, you, you either run or you die. Uh, there's very There's no combat to speak of. I haven't played very much of it. But uh, I'm I'm totally with you, and this may foreshadow some conversations later in the uh, 
in the thing but i i think combat is really essential to horror because it gives you like a slight glimpse or a slight effort into a pushback a push and pull it's one of the reasons why i like resident evil and i recognize that resident evil's uh, like trajectory of being comfortable with the horror means that it becomes an action thing at some point in time. Um, I think that's an eventuality when it does it. And it's like probably the only real problem with like actual combat like that, unless you're fatal framing, you're just great. And, um, but yeah, I agree. I think, I think running away from problems or hiding until the scripted moments done, um, it works for like cheap hide and seek scares, um, but I, for me, a more satisfying uh, interactive horror experience requires a little bit of a push and a pull between Predator and Prey. Yeah, and for that matter, I think it's entirely fair if the post-game reward for beating the, the scenario is the, that you switch it up. For example, the way that all of the really powerful weapons in an average Resident Evil game are locked behind game completion. Yeah, you have to play the game once, at least once, where you are relatively low on the pecking order, before you can graduate up to having an infinite rocket launcher. Now everything in the game only exists as long as you allow it to continue to exist. Yeah, like I think the game that really pushed me over on this was when I had to out review Outlast two a few years ago. I did not play more than an hour of that. I beat the well, first Outlast, but I was not connected with that so it's it's one of those games where i can understand they wanted to make an experience where you have to run and hide and sneak around because you are dramatically outnumbered and outgunned and that's the, your best chance of survival but at the same time it's a bunch of dumb shovel fucks out in the middle of nowhere it's not even the giant muscular bastard from the first game it's just a bunch of guys Mm -hmm. and you know i can start evening these odds really quickly it's just you're not allowing me to do so yeah yeah and it abandons it abandons one element and like when it becomes so scripted and it becomes much more of a particularly vulnerable thing where it's like oh i have to hide i have to run i have to sneak um i don't know I, it feels like they're deliberately skirting around um some sort of terror let me uh let me get back on track here so so you pretty much stated your opinions on the post silent hill games like regarding origins and homecoming right like are you positive on them it seems like you're warm to them well i'm a big b movie guy i'm a big fan of and i think it's kind of a flaw in video game criticism in general where there can be good moments or good mechanics in a bad game there, you know, you and I, re, and I appreciate painting for gold sometimes. There are, I think, Origins is arguably the most successful of the post silent team silent games. Um, Shattered Memories is a run and hide game, and it also does some un, really unpleasant things to the relationship between Harry and his daughter. Yeah, that I don't really care for. That doesn't strike me as needed in the first place. You could uh, argue, well, you could argue that like it is trying to put more character in, but I would also say in terms of Sam Barlow's work, which is not the most impressive, it is probably his weakest, and especially on some routes. Obviously, it's quote unquote meant to reflect the player, but like there's a lot of routes where it is deeply problematic, and it doesn't really have a sort of it doesn't understand its own emotional gravity. You know what I mean? Does that make yeah. sense? I think I, I get what you're going for. I think uh, I was about to say that I shouldn't be that precious about a relationship that was never actually shown on camera. Yeah. But so adding some context and some flavor to that uh, is entirely germane. And it felt like they were warming up for a follow up that never came. Yeah. But at the same time, allowing it to go that dark in that particular way where like you said some of the past go to some deeply uncomfortable territory yeah uh struck me as something that would have been better suited for original characters mm -hmm. rather than uh then a strange thing to these characters we know that yeah then then trying to reinterpret um the thing though on the other end i will praise it in the sense that this that's the kind of remake i like 
in terms of offering something new, but then it barely becomes a remake. It does very little otherwise, especially in gameplay. Yeah, you, like you go to a school, but it's like, I don't know. It doesn't really feel like a remake at that point. Then, yeah, you're right. It becomes its own thing. Sure. Homecoming is a really fascinating total misfire, which is kind of emblematic of everything about the post-Team Silent games that does that they do wrong. And Downpour, I never got too far into, but I'll give Downpour one thing in that. It is really effectively creepy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Downpour is in the rarefied territory where... Uh, when you put Silent... The thing is, at this point, when you put Silent Hill's name on a game, it sets a certain degree of expectation, at least for me. Sure. And rather than... it. Downpour has almost nothing to do with the lore, but that's fine. And it has some interesting things about its uh, moral path system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it feels like they really cribbed a lot of notes about atmosphere and design. More crucially, um, giving the player long periods of time in which they are in direct control of the character without being interrupted by a cutscene. Sure. Um... I don't want to make a full critical analysis because it's still in my backlog, but yeah. As as a game, I think that it took all a lot of the notes that it should have from the original games in the series. Do you think those games deserve a reevaluation? Has the reevaluation happened? Is it not there yet? Are we going to have to wait for this next Silent Hill wave to be like, man, we didn't know how good we got it with Homecoming and Downpour and Origins? <laughs> I think that the biggest problem you have there is Konami's complete lack of interest in keeping its back catalog in print. Sure. Um, off the top of my head, <clears throat> you might be able to download Homecoming and Origins on digital storefronts right now. I'm fairly certain Downpour is on the Xbox backwards compatibility list, at least. So a lot of these you can't play anymore without resorting to what's a set with your uh, emulation or preservation yeah. so that's going to be a problem yeah um i do think that with any game like that i think it's worth going back to look at and looking at what worked and what didn't because like i mentioned earlier criticism in video games is often so much down to a binary choice mm -hmm. or a grade scale yeah that i think it's worth talking about games in terms of you know, what individual facets of them were right, what were wrong, what didn't work, what was a big swing that failed, which is always valuable. And that's how developers mm -hmm. often function. They'll look back and go, you know, that was a really good idea. We should bring that back and then leave the stuff that didn't work so much. I think that's part of the iterative process of the medium, you know? Yeah. But at the, at the same time, Silent Hill in particular is very prone to what I tend to think of as cargo culting. Mm -hmm. the last the last time we, I was on the show Will talked a lot about the process by which re regenerating health became a thing post Halo Yeah, that in the original game you had the energy shields on combat evolved on, and that was such a boon to game design that it snuck into 75% to 80% of the, the action games that came out for the next 20 years yeah, And I think to a certain extent, a lot of horror and a lot of the post-team silent horror in uh, the genre has come, has looked back at Silent Hill 2 and fixated on one element or another of it as, oh, that's how horror works. There's another one that I forgot about until this very moment and also reflects this conversation and is also, I would say related obviously not as much how do you feel about pt uh i think that's very effective in a lot of very particular ways mm -hmm. um i don't like how you're meant to progress through it yeah because it's it's definitely in the spirit of really niche adventure games where it's difficult to work things out by context or by basic logic a lot of it's just uh going through it again and again and trying every little thing until something works and especially in the later segments it almost demanded a community element which is kind of bizarre for a horror game to principle itself on 
But um, it's also deeply influential and possibly one of the better Silent Hill media or pieces of work if you consider it Silent Hill, which I guess I would, but barely. You know what I mean? It's hard. In the in the sort of dream logic sense that makes it for good Silent Hill, I think it's very effective in that regard. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the big moments I would a lot of the big moments I would point to in. Silent Hill that are, as a series which are the biggest scares are the ones that legitimately come out of nowhere and have no o- obvious purpose. Yeah. Um, the one that a lot of people will point to is that inexplicable random giant giant Eileen face in Silent Hill 4. Mm-hmm. Has nothing to do with anything. Kind of makes sense in context but not that uh, right then or there. Just kind of there to freak you out and then it leaves. In, in terms of the fact that it's just a... It's very visibly a nightmare someone else is having. Yeah. It's it's very effective on that. And, and it really masters the random but memorable arc. In terms of just sheer vibes, it's probably the most successful Silent Hill follow-up there's ever been. Yeah. It would, it would just be nice if it was not also one of those adventure games you would find in the Walmart checkout aisle where some mutant who didn't understand how human beings worked... Uh, set up all the puzzles. I mean, Silent Hill puzzles can be a little obtuse at points, but I understand the comp- there is a difference between uh, the old school puzzle setup and uh, PT. Um, yeah. Or, like, have you ever played The Longest Journey? No. The Longest Journey is a very cool game with a lot of really interesting world building and a very likable protagonist, but... I have no idea how you would solve half those puzzles without a walkthrough. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just the adventure game logic of it. You know what I mean? Where it's like, especially like when you get to like that or the Sierra stuff where it's like, okay, maybe this works. You sort of wander around aimlessly looking for things. It's like, okay, this works. Um, And that I think it is good for a sort of haunted house element. I don't know. I do like PT a lot. I think I look back fondly on PT and wish Kojima uh, pursued horror again, which I guess he is, but you know, I don't know. Death Stranding at the very least is horror adjacent. You got to give him that. True. True. Yeah. And, and a lot of things from PT did carry over in my opinion, you know, thematically and all that, but that's a separate conversation. Um, I think we yeah, are... Go ahead. But but yeah, what I was kind of getting at was the idea that there are a lot of individual elements of the first three games in particular in the Silent Hill series where a lot of later developers, not just on Silent Hill games, but on hor- like indie horror in particular as a genre, hyper-fixated that on that and decided that is what makes the entire game. Yes. Um, um, yeah. layer- playing the short message in particular... It's very much like a hundred different indie first-person horror games where you're stuck inside a location and need to figure out what's going on. Yep. And uh, layers of fear, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. And... Feels almost cliche or not generic, but like we've definitely tread this territory before. You know? Yeah, that this is de- this is definitely going to turn out to be a game with a diluted, unreliable narrator, and just a question of how. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess what were your first impressions with the short message? Well, the, I, my first impression, the same was as a lot of other people's, which is, it is so desperate for you to not be confused that turns the character into a neurotic mess who's constantly talking to herself. Yes. One of the things which, and admittedly, this is going to be really hard to reproduce on any level, especially, but especially in 2024 when you're trying to make a triple A game, is that there are a lot of elements in the first three Silent Hill games which nobody ever tells you about and you have to figure out from the context. Yeah. And once you do, that means they hit all the harder. Mm -hmm. Like how... um, In Silent Hill 2, and I'm about to spoil the original Silent Hill 2, so... Kind of goes to the territory. Sure. Spoilers beware. Um, 
why does everything in James's other world look like it's heavily water damaged? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's why. You, know, yeah. you, you figure it out right at the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, for that matter, it took me years after I'd first played the original Silent Hill to figure out why all the other world levels looked like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, you know, why is everything fire damaged and you're in a basement somewhere? Because that's how Alessa spent the last eight years of her life. Yeah, the, that's that's one of the really cool things about the setting of the original games is Silent Hill was able to reflect not even like the psychology of the protagonist, but also the realities of the game. It also allows it to set a tone. And so like every time you see a game retread things, I'm not like opposed to like Pyramid Head coming back, right? I feel like there was like there is enough symbology within the town to have that. But also, it has to properly reflect what's going on within the game itself. I think that's super important for the setting to do. Um, I, I think my first impressions of the short message um, were very standard. I noticed, I think immediately, that I feel like this game wasn't meant for me. Did you get that yeah. feeling? I did. And that was actually something I thought of later on uh, social media. Is that I've I've seen that this there are there's a very particular demographic which this resonates heavily with. Yes. Which is to say, uh, depressed teenage girls. Mm-hmm. And I am over three on that description. Hold yeah. On. I'm one for three, but the depends on when you catch me. But <laughs> for that matter. I think that, uh, I mean, with every game, there are going to be people who resonate with it. I think the, at the worst, I will, be, I will be incredibly fair. I think by the time I walked away from it, I would say this is a C-plus sort of game. I agree. Maybe B-minus, if you catch me yeah, on a and, good day. Yeah, and if there was, a, there was a guy I talked to every once in a while, M.H. Williams, uh, used to be at 1UP. I think he might still be at Fan... No, he left Fanbyte, but... He's a game freelancer. He's been around for a while. He likes to call himself the black guy with the tie. Have you ever run into him? No. But he talked a while ago on Twitter about his concept of the favorite 7, ten, seven, seven out of 10. Yes. A I... game which is absolutely not something you can even defend as a proper, as an unflawed experience. But you still have a lot of affection for it. Sure. And I think that short message is aimed very clearly at being a lot of particular people, 7 out of 10, because there is a part of it which resonates explicitly with them. And if you're outside of that target zone, you know, already depressed kids who maybe with a uh, uh, certain certain unfortunate backgrounds, then it's not going to hit you as hard. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's... Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, please go ahead. I'm bad uh, um, you know, I think one of the weird things is, is like, we just talked about it, but like, we also said right at the start of this that our favorite Silent Hill was the one with a depressed teenage girl. I guess she's more anxious than depressed, but yeah. Heather's not in a great spot. Um, and I think that speaks to Team Silent being able to connect to things, but also maybe a little bit more distant. There is a lot more, um, dealing with teenage emotions in this regarding school and friends um silent hill 3 dealt a little bit more in like body horror and things yeah. like that um here yeah, there's a go ahead there's a lot in, there's a lot in silent hill 3 which is very expl- i think that if i remember correctly heather in silent hill 3 is meant to be about 17 yeah and there's a lot in the game which is reflective of somebody who is still very much in her uh, puberty, in, who is very much still going through the changes that come with early adulthood. Yes. And so there's a lot of stuff which if you turn your head and squint reflects that. Um, I think there's a fair amount you could say about how that sort of anxiety is reflected in a short message with a lot of really impressive imagery. I agree. For example, the, the rooms that are entirely wallpapered in post-it notes. That's a really cool gimmick. Mm-hmm. And But at the same time, like I was saying, the 
because of the time at which they were made and how they were received, um, there was a lot about the early Silent Hill games which they let you figure out for yourself. Yeah. And Short Message never lets you just figure something out for yourself in context. Either, there, either there's a specific note about it, or uh, Anita will just say it outright, outright, out loud to herself. This goes into another element I wanted to save to later, but I'll go ahead and bring it up now. I mean, this is a free game, too. And this is yeah. the start, quote unquote, of, in my opinion, of what's going to happen later. Like, this is like the first real game Konami's come out with. They've shown Silent Hill 2 remake footage before, but to me, this is also sort of like a sort of a like a check-in reminder of hey, Silent Hill exists, and they want young people to play it. And I think with that, that means a lot of them, especially Konami in general, shit, Silent Hill 2 probably doesn't like the remake. Probably going to be way less subtle, and this does also remove subtlety perhaps to draw in new people and uh, make an impression on younger players, but I think it's to its detriment. Yeah, and for that matter, they needed a they needed a stronger brand refresh than this to wash the taste of Ascension out of everybody's mouths. Yeah. And this was not that. No. It was a... There are, it's not hard to see a few changes that would make Short Message a fairly effective horror piece. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not... There's a lot about it which isn't really a Silent Hill game. And it's not like this is a series which has ever had a particularly strong brand identity, especially since the end of the Team Silent era. Yeah. But... I think there's something in there which is interesting that is very subtle and it's near the end of the over of short message mm -hmm. there's a note you can find in the third loop where it's a magazine article that identifies the silent hill phenomenon yes about how uh people have been overcome by mental illness and have reported all seeing uh inexplicable clouds of fog and the idea, and I have no idea if this is what they're going for, but the idea that the effect of Silent Hill, where it draws in troubled people and runs them through a gauntlet, and then either holds onto them forever or lets them go, depending on their actions, has spread wide enough to hit what appears to be a bad part of Germany, mm -hmm. which means it's crossed at least one ocean, is kind of a compelling overall idea for how you would go somewhere with the franchise yeah that whatever is wrong with silent hill is has expanded is leaking and could theoretically cover the entire world um and you know what when you say that my brain is like working its gears um there's a silent hill f coming out which i we don't know anything about but looks very japanese so perhaps there will be a lot more um like that will be the setting for it and in this there may be it may discuss generational trauma or things like that um, regarding Germany. Um, obviously, there being a lot of uh, trauma there, but I guess the game doesn't deal with that either, so I, maybe that's a thematic misfire by me. But either way, um, that all works. Um, I liked how it built the setting. You only read it in a couple news clippings, um, but I actually quite liked, especially like the Witch's Curse stuff, all of that I enjoyed. Yeah, and I, th I thought there were some interesting ideas. In the, for example, in the second loop when you're exploring Emily's, Emily's life. Yes. Um, that was relatively well done. And I, I do think that the second loop is when the game starts becoming more sure of itself and starts doing more interesting things. Yes. Um. For example, the ambiguity about whether or not Emily is actually still alive or not. Yeah. And for that matter, the really late introduction of the idea that uh, Anita herself might have been stuck in here for up to six months. Mm -hmm. You know, these loops she's been going through are much longer than they appear, apparently. Yeah. 
time dilation. Um, to, to keep talking about things we enjoy, I enjoyed the monster design. I think the creature, um, I believe it is designed by Ito. Um, it looks good. I think, I think it is beautiful in a graceful way. And once you get far enough, you pretty much piece together what the symbolism is. And like you immediately viscerally get it. Again, not one for subtlety, but it is graceful and beautiful. And then when it gets to you, it is scary. Um, I think it's effective yeah. in that sense. And using the phone to replicate the weird radio static from the original games is a pretty decent idea. Mm -hmm. I thought that it's using the smartphone as a, an accessory rather than a hindrance. There's a whole thing in screenwriting in general right now where they talk about how a lot of people have resorted to writing movies that are set before about 1994. Because because uh, communication stuff. would solve half the problems. Yeah. You know, find your favorite old 20th century movie and figure out if you give each character in it a not even an iPhone, just like something they can use to make calls from anywhere, how much of that movie simply does not happen. <laughs> yeah. What if after immediately after a scene someone tells someone else all the information they know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually saw Eli Roth's Thanksgiving last week, which does a really interesting bunch of stuff with uh, really making use of the fact that everybody in it has a smartphone for uh, additional horror and plot convenience and all that good stuff. Def a movie that works with the limitations imposed by smartphone access rather than just saying, well, this had better be set in 1990 or we will never get this movie done. Yeah. But short message using the smartphone as a stand-in for the radio with its crazy bursts of static uh, is a smart move. I especially liked how it's even if I hate the last chase sequence, I, I like how it's how the smartphone's used, where it shows you the uh, exit door every time you find one of the mom the uh, keys. We will moment. definitely get to that last segment because I also did not like it. Um, um, but the monster, I did think it was. <laughs> there were definitely a couple of the earlier chase sequences where I wasn't sure if I was running from anything mm -hmm. or if um, I was just having some kind of because. It just felt like Anita was running, and if whatever it was was close enough behind me that if I turned around to take a good look at it, it was going to get me. But there, there is, I there thought, is actually a button that allows you to look backwards. I did not. Yeah, <laughs> that was also part of it where I was definitely not in a position to uh, <laughs> sit down and experiment with the controls. Yeah, and also uh, its patrol routes are weird. I don't know. And also, this goes back to. I guess aesthetic design or whatever. A lot of the tunnels, especially when we get to the last, the uh, the last sort of stage or whatever, where you have to find the pictures, um, it's hard to navigate, and it's literally only hard to navigate because of how dark and like very difficult to see things. So I have to go by like very specific landmarks, and in that, it's just like annoying because you're also running. You are running away from something, and then it just becomes like a mess. I would genuinely like to know how the pursuit monster changes during that fight because I'm wondering if it's set up to rubber band so if it gets too far away from you it automatically teleports somewhere near you but not near line of sight because there are a couple of places in Resident Evil 2 the remake where Mr. X will behave like that. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, it definitely does it at least once or twice after you pick up a picture. I think consistently, because I had to run it through like three or four times. Um, it consistently, after I got like one picture, there was definitely like a, oh, he is here now, you know. Yeah. Um, so. And the, there were definitely a couple of times where I had to open a door and it was directly on the other side of it. Oh, and absolutely. Was, yeah. And I screamed like a cheerleader. I'm, I'm comfortable enough to admit that. Yeah. But it's effective in those moments. Um, I think it's yeah. effective when it does that. It's not effective when you have to navigate and actually like play, play. But I mean, I for the low price of free, I think it was um, serviceable. I would recommend playing it, especially if you are a horror fan. Um, I will say also, how do you feel about? We're gonna go a little bit more serious here. I shouldn't have been just as light. 
I think one of the problems when we talk about like the emotional stuff with the teenager stuff is this game, like Shattered Memories, deals with some heavy concepts. And I think its execution depends on your own personal mileage. Uh, specifically regarding self-harm and suicide. Um, yeah. How did you I really, feel? I was really expecting the self-harm aspect to play more into it. Mm -hmm. If only because of that brief shot you see early on where, where Anita has a bunch of uh, self-harm scars in her left arm. Yeah. I think that it confronts the entire thing about as well as it has to. I do think that a game where the ultimate message is suicide is not the answer probably should not have two different level transitions where the main the viewpoint character commits suicide. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and at the end, or like there's there's like a book end element to it where like it starts with like oh you know strong people don't need other people and it ends like that but it's much more like not tongue in cheek but it's much more aware that this is not the way to it, it to me it properly communicates that you should see seek help but I feel like it is also misplaced in execution. I don't feel like the, the sentences on screen um, convey what it's going for well enough. Yeah, Anita starts the game in a very deliberately dark place and is telling herself a lot of the things that you might be used to hearing from yourself if you've ever grappled with similar issues. And the only real pushback she gets on that is from Emily over the text messages, mm -hmm. but which she is free to disregard and vocally does. So in terms of, and now, like you said, the game eventually does work itself around to denying that position. Yeah. Where the way that Anita finds her way out is to embrace the help that some people are trying to give to her. And more importantly, to realize that much of the abuse that she'd suffered was not her fault. Yeah. But she has to go through the fire to get there. And it's definitely not something that's entirely comfortable in a way that is easy to go through, which is a really heavy lift for a video game. Mm-hmm. And I, d I would think that that will depend upon your personal boundaries. Yeah. And every scrap of the content warning that shows up at the beginning of the game and between each loop is entirely a good idea and should be, a, it should be heeded in its entirety. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would go... I, I, I definitely don't want to play it again, mostly for that, because it really does feel like... I mean, a lot of it makes sense in the end. Yes. For example, why is Anita investigating this building to find Maya when sh you eventually find out she hates Maya? And for that matter, she is completely, fully aware that Maya is dead. Yeah. And shit, it's I think you find that out by the second cycle. Like, I think that's second yeah. cycle territory. I think... The game really does hint at it effectively right from the start, if yeah. only because it has the Silent Hill name on it. And I think anybody who's played both this and Silent Hill 2 is going to look at it and go, oh, that's the thing. Yeah. This game for is... That matter, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, this game... I think we're about to say the same thing. This game is definitely following the Silent Hill 2 blueprint to an unfortunate degree, which is effectively a spoiler. Yes, I think... Well, I was going to say, I, I saw elements of 2, 3, and 4, but, like, 4 is a little superficial. Obviously, there's a fucking chained door um, and some other elements near the end. And 3 obviously deals with an anxious protagonist. But you're right, regarding the core character relationship dynamics, um, especially, like, someone that is looking for a way to reason through their guilt because my uh because they are like anita is guilty of something even though she, it's not a lot of the trauma is not her fault um she also has to wrestle with what she did between you know maya and emily you know yeah 
And for that matter, if you look at it from a dispassionate perspective, what uh, Anita did wasn't enough by itself. She was just the last straw that broke the camel's back. You found out that Maya was going through a whole hell of a lot. Yeah. And then you, then you, then Anita's action, through no fault of her own, broke the last support network Maya effectively had. Yeah. Do you feel like the FMV live action sequences were to the game's benefit? Not really. If for no other reason than it's a game that already takes a lot of a, a lot away from the player. You do spend a lot of time watching Anita react, watching things change, watching things happen without any interactive portion. Yeah. The inter, the uh, FMV is well done for what it is, but there's way too much about this which isn't a game already. Yeah. And that's just more fuel on that particular fire. And especially, they could have doubled down or interpreted better the graffiti art aspect. You could have utilized the graffiti more within the setting itself, like the, the building, um, in my opinion. Um, oh, yeah. Like, did you, did you play Alan Wake 2 yet? Yes, I have. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, exa yeah. yeah, I know exactly what you're thinking. Yes. It could have done that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it doesn't do that. And I think the FMV, the one thing I would defend the FMVs for is I feel like the connection to Maya does need to feel separate from everything else. Like it's sort of like in a white space typically, and she is a very friendly, inviting face and it invites some like sinister element to it, especially with your phone text messages to someone that feels like it's not Maya. You're like, oh, what the fuck's going on? So th there's a nice balance there. And I feel like those cut scenes need to be removed from the typical presentation. But you're right with what the game, with how the game is, how short the game is, and how much story there is. It feels like it bogs it down, ratio-wise. Yeah, it would make more sense if those were a collectible or something, or if they were automatic, if they were, you know, being shown on TVs that you could walk by. Yes. Um, or failing that, I mean, they're effective in that they definitely do, like, the fine details of the game are very good. A lot of presentation, a lot of the presentation of Short Message has been thought through very carefully. In the third loop, when you're going back to uh, Anita's childhood home, and when you first get there, all of the furniture is oversized. Yeah. Because it's Anita's childhood memory when she was shorter. Mm-hmm. That was a really nice detail, and I'm glad somebody thought to do it. Mm -hmm. This is not a game that was made thoughtlessly. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Somebody, very, very strong effort was put into the building itself, the world building, the fine details. It's just that, to a certain extent, it's, it was not allowed to have any subtlety to it. Yeah. And that undercut the entire presentation. Because while horror does not have to have subtlety to be effective, there is a lot about the Silent Hill name in particular, which invites a more subtle presentation where this would have... And there's a lot that, about the short message in particular, which would have worked if it had been led up, led up to the player to figure out on their own. I, I don't know if we're... If, if if this transitions or not, but do you feel like the future of the franchise will not be subtle? So with Bloober team, I played the medium. I cleared the medium, mm -hmm. which is their 2022 game. I played like 40 minutes of that. <laughs> well, and the thing is, the medium is very clearly them already trying to make a Silent Hill game. Yeah. To the extent where it feels... Uh... Okay, 2020. No, that's a movie. Um, to a certain extent... The... Yeah, 2021. The medium feels like it's their audition pace for being allowed to make another Silent Hill. Yeah. And... 
to a certain extent, it's cargo culting, like I mentioned earlier, off of the world transition aspect. Mm -hmm. And it does do some interesting things with that mechanic. But at the same time, it's not really doing it towards any particular purpose or just it's simply saying it would be neat if we made a game built around that so they did that and much of the story they're trying to use to tell is nonsensical or too complicated by half or doesn't make a lot of sense or is does nothing to do with your viewpoint character marianne so this begs the question thomas for bloober it, with the medium and it not having a core story and direction for it to be other than just we want to make a Silent Hill, now that they have Silent Hill, now that they're making a Silent Hill 2, and there is a thematic foundation, right? Do they un do you think they will understand it, or do you feel like it will be the same mistakes? I think anybody who wants to make a game that was inspired by Silent Hill 2 should be required to submit a paper to a public database at least 800 words long <laughs> about what w what worked and did not work about Silent Hill 2. And if you are going to be graded and if you don't get at least a B, then you don't get to make a psychological horror game. Yeah. And I do not I do not have any great faith that Bloober team under fully understands what it is they're getting into for one thing they're in kind of an insurmountable they're starting this off at a pretty strong deficit already i don't think silent hill 2 is a game that can be remade and that's not because i think games are sacred i actually don't give a fuck regarding remakes like a lot of times i'm like yeah whatever um i think the issue is is a lot of what made Silent Hill 2's execution work are things that hold things that would hold the game back in 2024. You know what I mean? Like, like the combat, for instance, everyone's complaining about the combat. It looks like Resident Evil 2 remake combat. And it's like, yeah, uh, part of me can't blame them for wanting to quote unquote fix the combat, but the combat should not be fixed. It should just be the game it is. You know, well, one of the things that I started to say but didn't when we started this conversation is that the thing about Silent Hill combat for me has always been that it, for all of its clumsiness, it's always consistently depicted as the last thing you should do. Yeah. Unless it, in the first three games in particular, melee is so strong and healing items are so prevalent, even on harder difficulties that you can build up a body count with very little difficulty. You can solve a lot of your problems by just killing everything which steps to you, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. Especially if you're out in the town. Mm -hmm. So, you being an absolute combat monster is simply there to check a box and isn't really important. You know, I can beat everything to death that comes at me with a 2 by 4 no yeah. big deal, but it accomplishes it precisely zero. So James being more combat savvy in a more Resident Evil 4 sort of way in the remake doesn't really bother me as long as they keep that effective uh, enforced uselessness of the prospect. You know, I can stack this building floor to ceiling with dead mutant nurses but what good it will do they'll just you know either they'll just be more or i'm still going to be just as stuck in this puzzle as i was do you have confidence in anything else like do you have i don't have confidence in konami i'm gonna go ahead and I, say that you know, i think konami konami has made a lot of noises which make it very clear that it has been completely colonized by vc guys yes they don't care about this so much as it is this is a pure brand reactivation to them, and if it doesn't work, they'll just wash their hands of the entire thing. Yes. The, the big issue that I have with remaking Silent Hill 2 in particular, which I was talking about in the Discord that you and I chat on, mm -hmm. is that it's a game that is built entirely around a huge central twist at its finale. And the game being over 20 years old now means everybody who cares to know knows about it. Yeah. 
It's well beyond spoiler territory. It's it was his sled territory. Yeah. And remaking something like that is automatically going to be a thankless proposition because either you change the twist and therefore are going to be accused of infidelity to the source material, or you leave the twist intact and then everyone is annoyed because you kept something in place they already knew about. And either way, there's, there's no winning there. I think the only thing they could do, and I don't think Bloober Team has the stones to do it, is kind of like what Square Enix did with the Final Fantasy VII remake, where by the end of the first release back in 2020, it is very clear that you are not playing a remake. You're playing a sequel. You're playing a sequel. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of room in the dimension-shifting, reality-altering goofiness of Silent Hill to do something like that. The series never established a canon ending for Silent Hill 2. All you ever know in the lore is from that blink-and-you'll-miss-it bit in Silent Hill 4 where you find James's father's apartment and he hasn't seen James in years. Yeah. So as far as the outside world knows, James went to Silent Hill again. He might not even told anybody. He just disappeared one day. Yeah. So part of me would very much like to play the version of the game, which is James has been doing this for 20 years and has yet to figure out the way out. Yeah. Because there are a lot of endings of the original game which indicate that... This is a loop. This is reoccurring. Yeah. Yeah. James is more likely to do something which will put him right back on this path than he is to do something which will break the cycle. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, off the top of my head, three out of the four endings involve him either cooperating with the town, staying in the town, or killing himself. And I mean, the Maria ending is like, if there is one message to the Maria ending, it is things are going to repeat. You know? Yeah, you will, be, you will be right back here in the foreseeable future. Uh, you are... You have gone through all of this and learned nothing. Yeah, and the and the idea of James as be, as being that self blinded of a character is very much borne out by the text, I think. Yeah. And this is definitely me doing something which I have made fun of people for before, where I've written the sequel I'd rather see in my head, and now I'll be disappointed if it's not that. There is going to be a new ending, apparently. I think it's all not going to be in taste. I have, I have little faith in Bloober. I'm one of those people that has low expectations, and I want things to work out. I want the game to be good. I never want a bad game to You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I also don't have faith. There is, no, there is never any long-term satisfaction in being cynical. Yeah. It would be grand if Bloober did some, you know, pulled a swerve. To a certain extent, this does feel like what they've been preparing to do their entire life as a company. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said, the medium is basically a Silent Hill game already. And, I mean, I'm willing to keep my expectations high, well, realistic, but positive. But I think they would have been better served to do something like The, you know, a new an, a new entry in the series, which draws a lot of... For example, I mean, Silent Hill 2, and this, the, the series never really glommed onto this, but really opened the doors for the idea that this is a town where reality does not work correctly. Yeah. And the powers behind it go looking for people who are broken in some significant way and run them through their paces until they're either killed by it or they escape. Yeah. The idea of Silent Hill as an anthology setting, which is all about the broken and damned washing up on their shore, so to speak, Mm -hmm. is really, really rich. And nothing from the comics to the later games has ever really effectively capitalized on that. The closest thing might be Downpour. And even that has its issues. Yeah. And and with the idea of the Silent Hill phenomenon introduced by... uh, the short message, which is explicitly based in at least 2022. Mm-hmm. So, at least, if I remember correctly, the ori- the original timeline, Silent Hill 3 is in something along the lines of uh, the late 90s. It's only a couple of years. 
the the timeline's really hazy, but I remember somebody saying that the producers of the original game meant it to be set in like 1986. Mm. But the idea that in this hazy timeline, there have been effectively 20 years where nobody's been paying attention to Silent Hill and just been pulling in these people to feed off of them and grow bigger to the point where it's in Europe now. But to a certain extent, Konami has always wanted Silent Hill to be their Resident Evil. Recognizable monsters which persist from entrance, entry to entry. Um, a certain degree of action. And uh, a, like just a weird amount of devotion to some really hazy lore. That nobody involved truly understands. <laughs> oh. Cautiously uh, optimistic is where we're at. Um, do you have final thoughts on the actual game? This is a short message. I mean, if you've got a PlayStation 5, you like horror, you don't mind walking simulators, and uh, you are not going to be put off by some really stark depictions of depression and suicidal thoughts, then it's worth two hours of your time. Yeah, and I don't um, mind if this if this was what Silent Hill would be, like this anthology thing, like as you said, I think I would be less hesitant. Um, the next thing being out of the gate being a two remake always makes me hesitant, but like this, at the very least, it gave me hope that like, hey, you know, they're trying. Whoever's developing this cares, um, even if the publishers yeah. don't. So yeah, I would recommend it with like a lukewarm thing. I mean, it's free, so yeah. Know. But like you said, but at the same time, like you said, it does feel like there's a lot about the short message, which is self-consciously a brand reactivation yeah there's stuff in there which is there because it's a wink back to series history and uh that might be exciting to pub the publisher but as a player i'm kind of sick of being winked to by every piece of culture i consume yeah it didn't uh, used to be it didn't used to be like easter eggs were like the fucking thing easter eggs are not depth you know and if you, if you really look back at the history of the series, everything after, I mean, 4 is an original game which got the Silent Hill name relatively late in production to capitalize on the brand. But So the official, the real canon of Team Silent, Silent Hill is the first through third games. Yeah. And everything that was made in Silent Hill after that point was... In addition to the lore, which was based on a, often based on a flawed understanding thereof and didn't have to be there, an attempt to tell a, well, and an attempt to tell a sort of new story, or just something completely bananas which didn't have anything. And I'm here. I'm speaking of like Silent Hill, the arcade, mm -hmm. which is, if you know anything about Silent Hill lore, is the funniest thing you'll ever see. It's about a it's boat, a light, right? No, it's a light gun shooter. Yeah. And the best thing about it is, though, that the monsters are all taken from, you know, two and three. So it's two complete strangers who come to Silent Hill on a boating vacation and end up shooting a bunch of representations of somebody else's psychological trauma. Oof. So I, it's I, very, I, I. I'm having somebody else's nightmare, but fortunately I have a shotgun. So I don't have a lot of, and part of this is admittedly having put Silent Hill 2 on a pedestal. I don't have a lot of faith in anybody to make a Silent Hill game which capitalizes on the strengths of that up to and including its, its moments of subtlety. Uh, I think that the best game to capitalize on the whole thing so far is still signalis oh signalis is such a good game highly recommend it was a, it was like top three games of the year i think it was my number two when it came out yeah i mean part of me really wants to do the philip jose farmer thing where uh signalis is what happens after two thousand years of the silent hill reality portal <laughs> or some shit That's but funny. that would be well you know the uh the i think he calls it the wold newton universe mm-hmm Philip Jose Farmer has this whole thing where he managed to link everything in pop culture into a single universe together. 
And every once in a while I think about that and start thinking about like drawing conspiracy lines between different properties. And it's a <laughs> fun mental exercise, but makes no sense. It's kind of like the uh, Tommy Westfall theory from St. Elsewhere. Oh, uh, yeah. The snow globe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't even need to draw lines to at least like clearly see the inspirations in Signalis. You know what I mean? So. Oh, no. no I, I think if you... Uh, no, I actually did talk to the developers, and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, we we knew what we were doing." Yeah, um, I remember I interviewed the guy behind uh, Sultan Sanctuary once, and he uh, and he was talking about how his games all tend to be very deliberate adaptations of whatever he's been enjoying lately. Mm -hmm. And he, I remember, and I said to him, "You know, it's really exciting that you just said that outright instead of dancing around it." And he said something along the lines of. Uh, I was sitting in a complete cultural vacuum one day when, you know, <laughs> mocking the usual, you know, my, my, inf I don't have any influences. Everything just comes to me out of the perfect mind space, which is inside <laughs> my head. And it's like, it's always refreshing when you run into something like, no, 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 we love Silent Hill 2 and we love brutalist architecture and anime and this is what happened. Yeah. <sighs> well, but yeah, I, I, but yeah, I think... I mean, it costs nothing to be cautiously optimistic, but Silent Hill has been consistently mismanaged for the better part of 20 years. And I mean, like, that's just Konami's, like, we're not going to get into it, but Konami isn't, doesn't have a good track record with other franchises. Castlevania, Metal Gear, you know what I mean? Like, the, fact that, the fact that Konami has had five seasons now of a top ten western animation series based on the original castlevania lore and we have not even heard a whisper of a new game in the series by now is just the most befuddling thing in the world to me even if they'd just done another 2d pixel art metroidvania which theoretically would not have been a high budget production i think they would have been okay i don't think they're in the i don't think they're in the business to make games anymore no, they're in the business I, of something a pachinko and something else, you know. Yeah, they're in the business of cashing checks. Yeah. If you ever, if if you ever want to see something real funny, look up the uh, Castlevania pachinko machines. Oh yeah. They've got their own lore. There's a chick in there named Victoria who apparently invented the booty shorts in 1750. Ooh, you're selling me. You're selling me. Maybe they're oh, not so wrong after all. Because <laughs> you know, if you're gonna go vampire hunting, and I'm talking to the audience now. If you're going to go vampire hunting, it's really important that both of the biggest arteries in your body be fully exposed. There you go. Oh, man. Both of your femoral arteries and your thighs should just be right there, ready to be bit. Because that's you, that's you flexing. That's you showing your lack of fear. Wow. Well, Thomas, on that note, I thank you for this wonderful conversation. And, uh, yeah. yeah. You, and, you, if anybody from, and if anybody from Bloober Team hears this... Uh, Nothing personal. I did finish the medium. There was a lot going on there. There it's you just, go. You're, uh, you're, you're, you, you kind of set yourself up with a... It's not even a hill to climb. It's a straight, smooth, featureless cliff. The you best thing you could do is prove him wrong, Bloober. Yeah, that's probably about right. <laughs> Where can we Are find you, you Thomas? Uh, right now, I'm still at GeekWire. Uh, bloody Disgusting. Uh, just got the nod that I'll be writing some guides for Fanbyte in the near future. Um, and uh, amazing. And I still regularly contribute to The Escapist. Wow. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, you listen to the Daydreamcast. Take it easy, folks. Hey, that was good. I.